when we just come to this place now, we come and worship and sing praises, adoration to you, O Christ our King. Amazing love that you know. Amazing love.
Father God, thank you for these brothers and sisters that surround me now. Uh, they just love on each other and carry us through. Praises to you, Father, for giving us this place where we can come and worship you and sing songs and praises to you and open up your word that we can hear and just how possible your doing the impossible is in saving all of us and making that provision so that we can be right with you through your Son, our King and our Savior, Jesus. The impossible. The way possible. Father God, thank you. We praise you forever. Father God, now we, as we gather up our tithes and offerings, we pray your blessings upon them, that you would multiply them, so that it would maintain this facility and those that rely on it, but also those outside of these walls that are blessed by your people that come and worship and gather here today. Father God, we pray, pray, pray your blessings upon God. Is it, it is in Jesus' name that we do all this. Amen.
what the word tells is that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins so that everyone who would believe upon his name would have everlasting life. Father, we want to live our lives accordingly so that others would see Christ in us, so that others would want to turn their lives over to Jesus, and so that others who knew you intimately at one time would be restored to right fellowship because they see you at work in our lives. Yes. Father, we just ask now that your Holy Spirit would take your word and would apply it to our hearts as you see fit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, children, please come forward. The rest of you are free to... <laughs> Pam, 
I understand that some of your hair designs come from him, right? <laughs> no, not really. When I wake up sometimes, my children come to me and say, uh, Dad, um, Mrs. Einstein called and Albert wants his hair back. <laughs> but do you know that in 1952, he was offered the position of the second president in Israel? But a scientist is president. <clears throat> Interesting, but he turned it down. How many of you have had these weird dreams where you're being chased by someone and you're just running and running and that same tree is there as you're running? Or you're, you're trying to kill this lion or elephant or tiger or whatever it is that's charging at you and you, you raise your gun up and it kind of does a Bugs Bunny. It's kind of goes, just nothing. You're, what do I do here? How do I get this? Well, of course, you and I know. It's a dream, right? But did you know that Napoleon was actually attacked by a bunch of rabbits? And Bugs Bunny wasn't one of them. Now, can you imagine? You say, oh, come on, that's impossible. Well, historians show it happened. Uh, you've heard of a cat call? There actually is such a thing. In 1929, a bunch of Princeton researchers actually took a live cat and it became a telephone. They were actually able to communicate to and hear from them. How that happened, I don't know. I, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. There's some scratching in my ear. You know, it, it seems impossible. Everybody, election year, right? We're looking for someone to save us. The, the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan, when he was in high school, he was a lifeguard. And he actually saved 77 different people's lives. Whoa! That's amazing for someone that that's their full-time career. We hear a lot in school, we hear a lot in the media about the South, the Confederate States, and how evil and wicked and stuff like that they were uh, because of slave trade. But did you know that the Confederate <coughs> nation of the United States, of the states actually, the Confederate States of America, wrote in their uh, constitution a ban on slave trade. By the way, the generals that served in both armies, the South general didn't have any slaves. The North general had slaves. Impossible, you say. I know nobody was there, but the Great Fire of London, it destroyed a huge part of the city of London. 13,500 homes were destroyed. But what seems impossible is that only eight people lost their lives. Okay? You're saying, okay, what does this have to do with our scripture today? I'm glad you asked that. Because for as many impossible things that we think are out there, none of them holds a candle to what we're going to be looking at today. It's the conception and birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 34 through 38 today. Now as we think about this, there's a lot of impossible things out there. First of all, because of the sin nature, which is part of all humanity, every single person in here had that sin nature from birth. And because of that, it is impossible for us to ever be reconciled to God unless God himself steps into the equation. It can't happen. Now there are some who would suggest that a virgin birth is possible. In fact, I know of someone who experienced a virgin birth. Don't laugh out loud all of you at once. Okay, I have a note here that, never mind. <laughs> Electronic devices pop up at the most bizarre times. The reality is, go back to your science classes. Go back to genetics 101. If it were even possible to experience a virgin birth, the only gender that could happen is a female. Because women don't have the Y chromosome that is necessary to produce a male offspring. Now why don't they talk about that? You say, you remember that in science class? No, I fell asleep since then. I looked it up again. Okay? So it, it can't happen. Now, some may wonder, why 
Why was this even necessary? We keep talking about the virgin birth. Why is that necessary? Why did God send an angel to talk to Mary about this particular thing? Well, first of all, if Jesus was to be the God-man, it had to happen in this way. Because if he were not born of a virgin, then there's a lot of the Old Testament that's false and full of lies. And the reality is, his whole time on earth would be a lie. I and the Father are one, can't be, if his dad were human. Because if his dad would have been human, and part of the conception process, then he would be just a man like any other man. That's why in this uh, musical Jesus Christ Superstar, as Mary sings a song, she says, he's just a man. That's her perception because she didn't understand the whole concept of the Virgin Mary. She couldn't understand what was so unique and special about him. Okay? So it was a very real mental wrestling match she was experiencing. And if he would have been fathered like a normal child, it would have been impossible for him to have been the savior of humanity. And if he couldn't have been the savior of humanity, then there could not be salvation for us because there couldn't have been a resurrection. In fact, anyone, any religious organization, any individual that would dare to suggest that Jesus was anything less than the God-man, they fall under Paul's curse in Galatians 1, that if anyone, even an angel, proclaim or teach any other gospel other than that which I proclaim to you, let him be eternally condemned. So all this other stuff that would dare to suggest that Jesus isn't God is of the devil. Now, the reality is, this sounds impossible, doesn't it? You know, we have eight children. I was there. Okay? You have two daughters. You were there. In fact, I, I hear that sometimes a woman, after giving birth, when the husband wants to kiss her and say, oh, you did such a wonderful job, she'll say, don't you touch me. <laughs> Why? The man was there. And the woman, truly, Labor Day really should be for moms. It be like a second mother day. That's true. Labor. Now, you and I also know something else that was impossible, right? The fact that we were enemies of God, we were headed for hell, and somehow God got a hold of us and made us a brand new person. Folks, that's impossible unless God's involved, right? So we're about to look at some things here that begs the question, impossible or not? And I like to answer with verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Whoever did this graphic, I would love it because what stands out? God. And look what's in the O. It's a baby. It's a baby. Isn't that awesome? That, that's a good verse. And as a result of this virgin birth, I and you have become a brand new person, a member of the family of God, living on this earth in the now with the hope of living eternally in the presence of Jesus Christ. Impossible? Not with God. So I want us to just consider this simple truth today. You ready for it? There. Now, I don't know what all's going on in your lives. I know some of you, what's going on in your lives. But just stare at that. Let it sink in, because that's what we're looking at today. Nothing is impossible with God. Okay, I'm going to digress just very, very briefly. I don't want to take a lot of time on this. But I am living proof of saying, there's no way God can clean up this mess. There's no way God can take me out of this situation that I found myself in growing up. God has overlooked this acreage north of Mr. Kansas. 
And interestingly, at the Billy Graham crusade that was on TV that night that my mother, thank you mom, forced me to watch, the song was played back in 1972. Nothing is impossible when you put your faith in God. The other day I sang it for the family and Joy just rolled her eyes and said, are we done yet, Dad? You know, I, I gotta finish it to the end. Okay? I'm not gonna sing it, so you're good. But that night is when I turned my life over to Jesus Christ. I repented of my attitude against Him. I said, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, Lord. You know the home. You know the environment. But I belong to you. And like that song that was sung earlier, if we die, I will follow you. I will follow you. So we're going to look, first of all, at a practical concern. Mary was a bright young lady. And in verse 34, Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? Now, last time we were with Mary, we left her in kind of a concerned, disturbed state because of Gabriel's announcement that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah. You know, that's not something you just pull out of a Cracker Jack box and say, guess what you want? Uh, so this is quite interesting. So she, she goes to Captain Obvious and asks the question, how can this be, since I'm a virgin? I can't think of a better question, can you? You, you hear this, and how can this be since I'm a virgin? Even if there were in vitro fertilization, even if there were surrogate parenting at that time, which now is available, the concept that a woman, even today, could possibly become pregnant without a man being involved in the process in any way is an impossibility. Okay. And I don't care what you read in the tabloids. It only works for MIB. It's not for real life. Okay. This stuff doesn't happen. Now, as we look at this passage in context, we really get no indication that Mary was shocked or that she doubted what Gabriel was saying. And you're going to see why I say that as we go through this. Because we often say... How can this be? Since I'm a you know, that's not what she's saying. It's not a question of doubt. It's like uh, the old movie, more input. I need more information. I need more knowledge. Help me to understand what's going on here. It's a genuine question. And, and sadly, some of our translations, and even the NASB translates can, when the word should be, will. How will this be, since I am a virgin? Well, that puts a little bit of a different flavor to the question, doesn't it? Okay, you say I'm going to become pregnant with a baby. How's it going to happen? I, I'd like to know, my if something is not normal. Okay? Now, I look at this and I say, okay, is this any different from us today? Because we know many times God's Word tells us to do something or to keep on doing something or don't do something. And it might not make any sense to us at the time, but we know because God says that it's true and it's right. We're correct? Okay. We know these things. We every now and then have these nudges from the Holy Spirit. And then we look at Scripture and go, yeah, that seems to be right, but I don't know quite how it's going to be. Because we'd like to know how our obedience is going to actually work out so that God is seen in the process. It's not necessarily that we don't trust God, we just would like more details. Us coming up here to Maine, remember I shared with you how we had a list of pros and cons, and the cons said, you shouldn't be moving up there. It doesn't make any sense. And the pros were, God was saying, I'm calling you. I'm calling you. And so, we had to say, Lord, how is this going to work out? We trust you, but, you know, I'm kind of a numbers and a paper and pencil kind of guy. I'd like to see the evidence there before me. And after we got up here, something else happened. And then at that point, we had to say, wow, God really does want us to trust him. He really does want us to move forward. But we did ask the question, how? How's it going to happen? 
And if you think about it, consider the fact that the Jewish people as a whole hadn't seen any miracles for 400 years. They hadn't heard about an angel coming from heaven with a messenger for over 400 years. No prophets had spoken. And Mary doesn't know that six months earlier, her relative got a message. You're going to have a baby boy, even though you're an old lady. That's a fair phrase. Okay? So she doesn't even know about this. So it's, it's helpful to understand that Mary recognizes all this stuff. And then here is an angel from God telling her, you are going to have a baby. And no man's going to be involved in the process. Her pregnancy was going to take place while she was a virgin. So her question is seen more of a, as a desire for more information. So we'll see how Gabriel responds. And this also helps us to understand that it wasn't doubt. It was, I need more information. We see a powerful clarification here in verse 35. The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Now, as I, I, when I prepare a message, I will often photocopy the passage and then write all around beside it. This passage, this verse right here alone, had so many circles and underlines because there's so much stuff in here that Gabriel shares with her for information. Uh, you see here, Gabriel didn't say, what do you ask a question like that for? Don't you believe me? Look, I'm Gabriel. He doesn't shame her. He doesn't make her feel bad about her question. He doesn't even respond as if she did have doubt. He simply gave the information. Very simply, Holy Spirit's going to do it. You're good? No, that's just Holy Spirit's going to do it. Well, I look back through Scripture, and I look at some of these phrases here. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. I'm going, hmm, what might that look like in the Old Testament? All you have to do is go back to Genesis 1-2. It says the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters, coming upon you. And I, as I look through the Bible, I see that the Holy Spirit seems to be very intimately and intricately involved in creation, from the creation of all that there is, to this, his son now becoming man, to you and I coming to salvation. You see, if the Spirit doesn't draw us, we don't come. The Spirit seems to be involved in all of these things. Now, for those who would dare to suggest that there was a human father that was involved in this conception of Jesus, very simply, they are denying God's holy word. They're saying they're smarter than God. They figured it out. And they negate their own hopes of salvation. Because if you deny the word of God, you have to deny that Jesus is God. And if Jesus is not God, he can't save you. Very simple. Then there's the phrase, most high. Now remember, we're still in the Old Testament era, right? So anytime Mary would have heard the phrase, Most High, she understands that that phrase is in reference to God, the Father being over all creation, superintending all that's going on in the affairs of man. He is omnipotent. He is sovereign. You can trust that. That same God who created out of nothing was going to create a life in Mary through His Spirit without a man. Now when you think about it in those terms, you're saying, what's so difficult about that? I mean, he spoke and the whole world came into existence. Surely he can cause a baby to come into the life of one of his children by just overruling the normal process. He's God. And it doesn't go against his nature to do this. Also, you see the phrase will overshadow that's the idea of a complete surrounding. But when you look at that in the context of the whole rest of the uh, of this section, it's very significant because of this divine miracle that's going to take place.
this baby would be unlike any other baby that's ever been born on this planet. He's called a holy child. Now, as darling as you may think your babies were, they weren't holy. They all had sin nature. And if you don't believe it, look in the mirror. You have sin nature as part of you. I have sin nature as part of me. And it, it doesn't skip a generation, trust me. It's all the way through from Adam. Thank you, Adam. This child would not have a sin nature. The whole of Scripture says that we're all sinners. Even King David says, I was born, I was conceived in sin. Now some have given a totally wrong interpretation and said, well, that's, you know, sexual intimacy is sin. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is, the moment I was conceived, which by the way, that's the best argument you need for pro-life. The moment I was conceived in sin, Sin nature is part of me. Part of my spiritual DNA. Job talks about it. Some of the prophets talk about it. The Bible very clearly says, all have sinned. It doesn't say, but some of you go pretty well. This is all of sin. There's none righteous. This child also shall be called the Son of God. None of us would name our boys the Son of God. Why would this be? Because his very nature is that of his Heavenly Father. Though Jesus would be seen in human flesh, but he says, if you see me, you've seen the Father. I am the very essence of my Father. That is my nature. Remember Hebrews 1, 3? Why, of course you do. There it is. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. That is said of no one else except Jesus. But Gabriel doesn't just leave Mary hanging with this theological explanation. He goes on and gives her some practical information and as a personal consideration in verse 36. He says, And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who was called barren is now in her sixth month. Again, I need to stress that Mary was not doubting. She's asked for no proof, merely more information. But I see quite often in our lives today, at least in my life, I'm sure you do in your life also, that God will sometimes take us along paths or put us in situations or have certain people come into our lives that will confirm and affirm that He is in charge. It's just a reminder for us. Here, the angel talks about Mary's relative Elizabeth. Now, we don't know exactly how they're related from this passage, obviously, but we do know from Gabriel's visit with Zacharias and uh, earlier on that Elizabeth has to be much older than Mary. Okay, are we agreed with that? Because she says, I'm too old to have a child. Or he said that. We also can assume that Mary would have been aware that Elizabeth was unable to have any children. And so for her to have a child is impossible. Gabriel introduces this with a kind of an exclamation when he says, Behold. Obviously, Mary is hearing this for the first time. That Elizabeth, even though she was old, she's going to have a baby boy. Well, you know. When we hear something like that, we rejoice, right? Wow, this is amazing. What a miracle. This is great. Everybody called her barren. She who was called barren is like, that was a moniker that was just on her. It was a sign of disdain that God had been watching out for her. So many people thought. Here, she's already six months alone. Now, some of you have gone through miscarriages, and some of you are very quiet until about the fourth or fifth month. Uh, by then, it starts to become a little bit obvious. It's not all the ice cream. God's doing a little miracle in there. Okay? So, if she's in her sixth month, you think everybody knew about it in her area. 
And so here comes the announcement to her. Now what seemed to be impossible wasn't. Here, a miracle of conception in old age. But Mary's going to experience an even greater miracle. And both of them seem way beyond comprehension, don't they? But both of them show who's in charge. And that's God. I, I love how God silent for 400 years and bang, bang. Miracles that are going to change the world. Change us. We may wonder why God had Gabriel give all this information if, in fact, Mary wasn't doubting. Have you ever made a decision in your life and said, this is what I'm going to do for Jesus. I'm committed to this. And then something comes along that causes you to really, really doubt what's going on. And then someone will say, do you remember that? And you go back to that marker in your life. But, yeah, I will keep on following Jesus, because I know nothing's impossible for him. He wouldn't have brought me this far if it wasn't possible. And I, I like how one person says, if you can make it possible in your own efforts, it's probably not of God. When you experience God doing the impossible in your life, you know it's God. Right? You know it's God at that point. That's what's going to be happening here. Well, we're going to go on to that verse, one of my favorites. Somebody asked me one time, what's your favorite verse? I just got to get that deer in the headlights look. <laughs> it depends. Depends on when in my life and what's going on in my life at the time. Don't know. But this is one of them. This is one of them. For nothing will be impossible with God. You and I know of people who make outlandish promises. We say, that's not possible. That's not. Even in the business world, we have the phrase that if it seems impossible, it is impossible. If it seems like it's too good of a deal, it is too good of a deal. Now that's a very, uh, I call it realistic. Some people call it pessimistic. But you know, it's just that idea, you know, if it seems too good to be true, it probably isn't true. Okay? But here, even though the world is going to fail many times, God will not fail. When God says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. You can't mess up God's plan. God never says, oops, didn't see that one. He never says, well, I'm going to come up with a different plan. This isn't going to work. God knows exactly what he's going to do, and it will happen. So Gabriel reminds Mary of what she already knew. You and I know that with God nothing is impossible, right? We know that. Do we need to be reminded of it if we know it? Yeah, I do. Many times. We may know it up here, but sometimes the emotions like to overrule what we know Scripture teaches. How could Mary know? Well, just back up a verse. We wonder why Gabriel said this if she wasn't down. Back up a verse. Elizabeth, your relative? She's already six months pregnant. Not even like those apples. Pretty cool. Well, if that's not enough, back up towards the beginning of your Bible. And if some of you are reading these things here, you're saying, oh, you know, this seems a little bit familiar. Remember what God told Abraham, Genesis 18? Is anything too difficult for the woman? I love it when God does rhetorical questions. You and I can't say, well, I, I know it's not, not, but... Well, look what he says here, a little further. He says, at the appointed time, I will return to you at this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Again, in my Bible where I copy things off, I have will circled every time it appears there. God says it, it will happen. Not maybe, not possibly, not could be. It will. It will happen. God is not limited. He's not bound by that which he created. He can do anything he chooses that is consistent with who he is. So when you and I have doubts and thoughts that something is actually possibly beyond God's abilities, 
we need to just reflect and remember what God has done previously. And be encouraged that He can and He will do whatever He chooses to do and whatever He needs to do to accomplish His perfect plan. Well, let's look and see what Mary's going to do about this. Verse 38, we see proper compliance. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now as we read this verse, some of you probably have in your mind this thought that that sounds familiar. I'm sure I've read that someplace else in the Bible. And you are right. 1 Samuel chapter 1, Hannah, uh, as she's pleading for a child. And then there's an appearance made by a heavenly being. As it were, and actually not through, it was through the priest, but the heavenly being gave the information to her. And she says, Behold, I am your maid servant. You may wonder what the difference between a maid servant and a bond slave would be. None. There, there really is none. In fact, the word here, and if you look on the left side, it's all you need to look at is the left column on the top. In the Septuagint version, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, or the Greek translation of the Old Testament, he used the exact same word as we see here, a bond slave. It's a picture of a slave who is completely willing to submit to the one over them and do whatever needs to be done. It's done without complaining. It's done without a feeling of being forced to do it. Oh, I have no choice. i got to do it. You know, it's a desire to please and to serve. Doulos, the under-Roman, the one that, not Roman, but under Rome, R-O-W, person. Uh, you want to do this. You want to honor. You want to please. It's a bond slave. I think we've got this North American idea that would use the word slave. It means whipping and scourging and all that. No, it doesn't. Do you know that you and I are slaves to Jesus? It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. We've been purchased from the slave market of sin. We're no longer slaves to Satan and his vile deeds. We're now slaves to Jesus. Because see, a servant could say, I don't think so. A servant could say, let's get somebody else to do this. No, a slave wants to do what the master wants that person to do. Because they have willingly gave themselves to their master. Mary saw herself rightly before the Lord. She was willing to do whatever God asked of her with no regard for her rights. You know, I believe that we as Christians, if we responded to God in the same way, wow, we'd be amazed at what we see God doing in our lives and around our lives and through our lives. But too often we try to put conditions. We try to put parameters and boundaries around. And we miss a lot. And again, as I look here, you know, here be the time where I'd expect Mary to say, well, okay, I, yep, okay, Joseph and I, we're going to get married here, then, so we can start getting things going. No. Not at all. You don't see that at all? Just very simply. May your bond slave do whatever it is you want me to do. She doesn't ask the angel how she's supposed to deal with all those people who are around her are going to say, you committed adultery. She's not, going to, she's not worried about the possibility that, you know, I'm going to start showing, you know, once this happens, unless this baby's a one-day gestation thing, it's going to be nine months of this, give or take a little bit. And you know what they do to pregnant women who are not married, they stole them. And she didn't say, what if Joseph chooses to have me stoned or divorce me? Do you see that here? Any place? No. And then I look at my own life and when I see God asking me to do things and I've got this bucket load of questions. Yeah, but what about, what about, what are they going to think? What's going to happen if I do this? Right? Or am I the only one that does that? I hope not. I'd like somebody else to be just as 
low as I am sometimes. But just very simply, whatever you want, God, I'll do it. I'll do it. Lose my job? If that's the way it is? Okay. You'll take care of it. I know you will. Rather than trying to figure things out on a human level, we can trust God. It sounds like a Sunday morning sentence song, doesn't it? You, 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 you can trust God. Mm -hmm. Now you've got that going through your head now, right? Good. Rather than concerning ourselves with what other people say or what they might do to us, we can know what the Scripture teaches, that God is our refuge. He is our fortress. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. Rather than having a doubting attitude, we can trust that all of God's promises will continue to be true. They're not going to change. And, and rather than the idea, you know, oh well, everybody knows I'm a Christian, so I better do it. Oh, cool. I get to do this. Thank you, Lord. I may botch it for you, but I'll do my best if you're going to help me. And he does. He gives us the ability, he gives us the power to do what he wants us to do. Kind of like the Romans passage. Present yourselves as living sacrifices. Holy and acceptable. A pleasing sacrifice. All those neat things combined together. Willing to do whatever. And, and the last sentence of the verse. And the angel departed from her. See ya. No poof. No boing. Just angel departed from her. Gabriel went back to what God wanted him to do. Leaving Mary <coughs> to continue living her life in obedience to God. The difference now, Mary knows something she didn't know earlier. She is going to be the mother. Bear the Son of God. Well, my wife, some time back, when I was going through some dark times, called me when I was on my way out to Chicago to a board meeting. And she shared this verse with me. And basically, as she shared this verse with me, at the end she says, Honey, God has your back. Don't worry. God has your back. And I think to myself, that's what God says to me. Child, I've got your back. Nothing's going to happen to you that I don't allow. And you can trust me. Mary would never have dreamed of being called the Queen of Heaven, as some have labeled her. In fact, she would have recoiled at such a thought. Because she knew that there was no other ruler other than God. But what Mary was made aware of was that she would have the privilege and the responsibility of bringing into this world God in the flesh. This baby was going to develop within her. This baby would develop and mature under her care. This child was going to become the Savior of the world for all who would believe in his name. Mary was like many of us wish to be, isn't she? She wanted to serve the living God. I can imagine when she was 10 and 11, she never thought that would happen. <coughs> when I'm driving the tractor all around and working with cattle, I never dreamed that God would put me in a position of a shepherd of the church. But as my wife and I prayed those many years ago, Lord, whatever it is you want us to do, Wherever it is you want us to go, we want to do it. And we're, we're yours. Have we ever fought at that? Fought with each other about it and fought with God about it? But when it boils down to it, we ought to have that good Mary had. Behold your bond slave. She wanted to obey as a slave with her master, yielding herself willingly to the Lord, regardless of any consequences. She wasn't concerned about the implications of being a mom before she was married because she knew she'd done nothing sinful to cause this to happen. This was God's doing. 
She didn't fear stoning because people would have accused her of being adulterous. Because God made a promise to her and he would not allow his plans to be derailed by anyone. <coughs> My prayer is that we would have the spirit and attitude which Mary showed. If God wants us to do something, let's do it. Let's just do it. Because we understand that with God, nothing is impossible. Let's stand as we pray together. Father, we are so thankful for the example given to us in your word about Mary. And we know she was just like us. She probably experienced the same fears and frustrations and concerns. But at the same time, Father, she was willing to do whatever it was you called her to do because she knew that with you, nothing is impossible. And so, Father, for whatever is going on in the lives of each person here, help them to understand, regardless of what it may be, nothing is impossible with you. We can entrust ourselves to you, knowing that you will work things out for your honor and glory. It may not be the way we think it ought to be, but we see things very darkly and very fuzzy. We want it to be done the way you want it to be done, Lord. And we commit ourselves to you, to be used by you for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.